welcome to this brand South Africa KPMG business broadcast coming to you from Abuja in Nigeria, where the 24th World Economic Forum on Africa is currently in session. We're looking at Africa competitiveness and driving that through cooperation, integration, and economic growth. We are also looking to the two big economies on the continent to fast track that process, namely Nigeria and South Africa. To discuss this theme further, I'm joined by Shay Bickerstedt. He is the head West Africa pa practice KPMG. Kaz Kavaya, who is the managing director of the Banking Association and also the acting CEO of Business Unity South Africa, or BUSA. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. We're looking at 1.1 billion people in Africa, 15% of the global population, making us the second most populous continent. I have one word for you, Shay. Intra-Africa trade, sitting only at 12%. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's very important um, what you said about um, the paucity you know, of intra-African trade and the fact you know, that uh, we really need to raise our game you know, in that you know, particular direction. Um, because you know, if you take a look you know, at Africa itself, you, know, I mean, you can talk about GDP growth, growth rate, you know, for instance, you know, People have talked about Sierra Leone in the West African region where I come from, you know, about having a growth rate you know, of about you know, 20%. You know. But it really honestly means nothing you know, um, at the end of the day. Um, if you take a look at some of the countries in Africa, um, you take a look at um, you know, Sierra Leone, Burkina Faso, some of these countries you know, um, can't do it on their own. Um, some of them are very poor, landlocked, you know, they don't have the population. So it's extremely essential that um, if we're going to have the kind of growth you know, that we're looking for in Africa on a, on a regional basis um, that we've got to integrate our economy. You know, extremely important. You know, and, that, and that trade, that figure that you mentioned you know, has to be you know, really um, jacked up. Kaz, the low-hanging fruit. Drop visa requirements on the African continent. And at the same time, to the Nigerians, please, can you reduce the size of your visa because if you, like me, visit Nigeria on a regular basis, you have to replace your passport on a regular basis. Yeah, it, it keeps our home affairs busy anyway. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think there are a number of areas of low-hanging fruit, visa requirements, border issues, transport issues, uh, having to fly from here to London to get to Algeria. I mean, it's just crazy. What we need to do is to show quite creative and, and, and good leadership, not just from government, from, but from business as well. Uh, and I think that the fact that WEF is Africa is happening here in Nigeria uh, gives us an opportunity for the two biggest economies, and quite honestly, it doesn't matter to me which is the bigger one. These are the two biggest economies on the continent. And I think that this gives us an opportunity to say what do we need to do to get these two economies to cooperate and to collaborate? In what areas do they do that and how do they do that? And I think there are some tough issues to address and to talk about, which we can go into, but, but I think that we'd be losing an opportunity and, and history will damn us from a continental point of view if these two economies don't actually come together and, and see how they drive African growth. I, mean, I tell you, you know, Swami, you know, low-hanging fruits, huh? My own opinion, based on practical experience, is this. Get rid of the guys at the border, okay? And I can tell you this, you know, from practical experience, you know. I mean, I used to go to the Republic of Benin a lot. I mean, the view going to the Republic of Benin is extremely scenic. You know, you drive down there, but then you get into a situation where a two-hour drive, you know, becomes a six-hour drive, you know, simply because of the people that you have at the border. You know, and after some time, you know, I just decided I wasn't going to do it. They had an hotel in the Republic of Benin that was being managed by the Sheraton. When people dropped off from that, you know, what, did, what happened? The Sheraton guys left. The Republic of Benin you know, lost the benefit you know, of the tourism dollars you know, that should have come to them. And everybody loses, simply because you have guys at the borders you know, who basically you know, are interested in themselves, you know, but are not interested in the bigger picture. So get those guys out of the place. You know, and I'm not only talking about in West Africa. If you go, for instance, you know, to the landlocked com com countries, you know, for instance, in East Africa, you have the same kind of complaint you know, about people g g getting from Mombasa, for instance, you know, to go to Uganda. You know, it's all over. You know. Why are we hurting ourselves? 
Let me put this out there as a challenge to all delegates attending the 24th World Economic Forum on Africa in Abuja, Nigeria. Let's get together and let's get the policymakers and the decision makers to drop visa requirements just between Nigeria and South Africa. Because those are the two big economies we're saying can fast track this process. Surely that in itself would go a long way to saying it is actually starting to happen. Absolutely, and that can be done easily. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, there's no reason why senior business people from South Africa and Nigeria shouldn't now be meeting post this to look at what are the competitive niches of the two countries and how we actually help each other leverage of those niches. There's no reason why skills and capacity from our two countries should be going to Europe and the US. We should be sharing skills and capacity. We should be building that in, South Af in, in Africa. I mean, just as an example, one of the things we do at the Banking Association is we chair and or we the secretariat of the SADAC Banking Association. We've put into place an integrated payments and settlement system for the CMA to pilot it. In the first week, we cleared more than all the other regional systems put together since inception. Now, the thing is working. We're now extending it to SEDEC. Why should we have different regional systems in different parts of the region? Why can't we use the best practice? You know, in South Africa, mobile banking like M-Pesa hasn't taken off. In Kenya, it's taken off tremendously. Let's learn from Kenya. Why has it happened in Kenya and not in South Africa? So there are best practices in different countries that aren't working in other countries. Let's see why they're not working. Let's leverage off each other. Let's bring stuff to, up to scale so that we can begin to address transformation issues, socioeconomic issues, and, and, and this, con this continent can actually reach the potential it, it should be reaching. I've got another challenge for you personally in terms of the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Report 2013-2014, South Africa again at the top ranks when it comes to our financial institutions, the regulation, the strength of those institutions. Can South Africa not fast track that process in the financial space across the continent? A absolutely, and, and, and we'd like to do that. Uh, we, we're certainly beginning to do that in SEDEC, uh, and through the SEDEC Banking Association, working with the SEDEC uh, central bank governance. We, we're beginning to look at coordination of regulation, harmonization of that. We, we're beginning, as I said, we've got the clearing and settlement system in place. And, and, and the frustration I sometimes have is that when we begin talking to financial sector regulators in other regions, and even financial sector representatives in other regions, there seems to be turf issues. There seems to be, no, you know, we want to build our own payments and settlement system. And, and, and our integrated system is the one we want to promote. Whereas, you know, I would say, look at what's working. It's absolutely clear that the one we put into place is working. Let's leverage of that and let's, let's bring that up to scale for the entire continent, okay, region by region. And, and I think that it's, it's those sorts of issues. If we're going to integrate, if we're going to collaborate and cooperate, if we're going to leverage of best practice, I think we're going to have to say that there is some trade-off in regional and national sovereignty issues. And there has to be some trade-off. Uh, but, but I think that if we actually manage those well, then, then as, as nations we begin to work together properly as regions and as a continent. Shay, I want to move to energy, because energy poverty is a situation that obviously plagues the African continent. And the stat out there most widely quoted is that most countries in Africa lose between 2 and 5% of annual GDP potential directly because of energy poverty. And that is, uh, one, the lack of energy completely, and secondly, the lack of reliable energy. Half of the Nigerians, we're talking about 170 million people, in this country live in darkness and the other half have that unreliable electricity. Surely we can pull together regional pools and perhaps this has been prompted by Power Africa and what President Obama is trying to do which was initiated in July of 2013. That you create regional power pools that can impact the energy situation on the continent. Energy is crucial for human development, for economic growth. 
Yeah, it is, you know. Um, but just, just based on the, on, on, on the experience of Nigeria, um, we know that it's, um, it's, it's a horribly complex you know, um, issue to tackle. Um, if you take a look at Nigeria, for instance, uh, part of the problem that we have is the availability of gas. Okay? I mean, this is a, a gas producer. You've been flaring country. gas for three decades. A absolutely. You know. But then you know, you've got to have the, you know, the ability um, to um, set up an infrastructure to collect the gas and make sure that the gas gets to where it should get to. Okay? We haven't been able to do that. So we have you know, problems with that. We, we also have problems with transmission. We have problems you know, with this, this distribution. Um, but getting the gas itself you know, in a, in a gas-rich country is a big problem for us. So um, while I share your idea about you know, having a, a pool, okay, a regional pool, in order to be able to resolve this problem, you know, I have to say to you that it's not a problem you know, that we can solve you know, very, very quickly. Um, it's a problem you know, that takes a long time to solve. And I think you know, the way to solve it you know, is, to, is to do what we've done in Nigeria, to make sure you know, that the private sector is leading you know, the charge. And to attract yeah. foreign direct investment. You yeah. have to have uh, a business enabling environment free from corruption. Do you think Nigeria is on its way to getting to that environment? Yeah. In my own opinion, basically, is that um, yes, we are. Um, if, you, if you let the private sector you know, direct that, you know, because you know, they have their own money on the ground, um, I think you, know, you take away a lot of, you know, a lot of these issues. You know. One of the things you know, you've also got to do with regard to um, taking corruption out of the system is that you've got to do something you know, about pricing. You've got to let the market reflect the pricing. Because if you don't, you know, you're going to have situations you know, where people are just realizing fortunes you know, from rent. And you know, we've seen that in Nigeria. So I mean, I'll say two things you know, in order to cut, this, to cut off the corruption that you're talking about. One of them is to make sure you know, that, you know, the pr that the price is market determined, you know, and also you know, that you have the private sector leading the charge. I think if you do that, you, know, you get you know, what you're you know, talking about. We're not going to have a, wand, a magic wand with a, you know, overnight you know, wave of corruption you know, in, in all of Africa. But we can set the scene you know, from what we do um, in terms of making sure that it's kept to a minimum. Foreign direct investment, I'm going to stay with this theme for a while because I, I think it's crucial to, to solving a number of, of problems on the continent. And I'm going to come back to the example in the power sector. The IMF is saying that we need $48 billion annually until 2030 to eradicate energy poverty across the world. Now, there are 1.3 billion people globally that do not have access to electricity. I've already made the point that 700 million of those are on the African continent. $48 billion required annually until 2030. Now, I put it to you that that is just 3% of total private sector investment into the energy space globally annually. Just 3%, and we almost eradicate energy poverty from the globe, not just from Africa, Kaz. So it's about getting that foreign direct investment onto this continent. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's two things. One is getting the FDI into the, onto this continent, and two is, is utilizing the resources that this continent has more optimally and more productively, okay, instead of wastage, instead of flight of resources, and so on and so on. And, and, and that goes to the heart of creating the environment for FDI. And, and you know, these are hard issues. The issue of corruption, it's not just Nigeria. We're facing it in South Africa. We're facing it in other parts of the, of the, of the continent. And, and it's not just corruption in government. It's corruption across the board. I mean, we've had collusive practices in business. Uh, we, on the way here, I read that one of the major unions in South Africa is, is, is taking money to place teachers in schools. So it's across the board. And, and unless, and, and you know, Robin, the critical thing to me is I think there's a dearth of leadership across the board. And, and but they I, say leaders are a reflection of the society that vote them in. Well, I'm, I'm not just talking about government. Yes, government leaders are a reflection of who we vote in. But I think there's also a dearth of leadership across business and across other areas of society. And, and, and that's because I think we're all looking at our own agendas. We're all in our little comfort zone. And I think what's needed is, is a, a, a brand of leadership that doesn't have too much skin in the game anymore, 
from a operations and, and so on point of view, but is able to actually look at national and, and, co and, and continental agendas and, and have some of the hard discussions, okay? So, so you know, things like, you know, I look at the, the, the regions and the regional borders and, and which country belong to which regions. To me, those are more political conurbations than economic conurbations. Uh, one country belonging to three regional conurbations, it's, it's stupid, to be quite honest. And why? Because we're not actually looking at what makes sense from regional boundaries point of view, from an economic point of view, from a sharing and capacitating resources point of view, and so on. So I think there are some hard discussions to be had, and I think we need to pull together a brand of leadership that's prepared to have those hard discussions. Shay, how do we go beyond the discussions? How do we make sure that these don't become continuous talk shops year after year, where we identify the problems and we don't see execu execution in the solution. Um, what do we need to do? I think, you know, one thing that we need, no question about, you know, what Kaz has said about the fact that, you know, this is a leadership issue. And it's, le it's leadership, leadership issue, not only with government, you know, but also with the, uh, with the private sector. One of the things, you know, we need to do is that we need to make sure, for instance, you know, that our political leaders um, in a sense, um, hand their ego, you know, at, at the door, okay? Because, you know, just like Kaza said, you know, we are honestly going to have to make some concessions which affects individual countries in order for these things to go forward. You know? So that's one, you know. The second thing is that I'm a very private sector-oriented person, you know, and I believe that what we should be doing in Africa is compressing the public sector and giving the private sector, you know, the chance, you know, to go forward. But, you know, having said that, you know, one of the things, one of the responsibilities, you know, of the private sector uh, in Nigeria is to be responsible corporate citizens, okay? You've got to play by the rules. You've got to pay your taxes, you know, you've got to do whatever it takes, you know, you've got to show, look, you know, you've got to show that you have a vision, you know? So that's why sometimes, you know, for me, I cringe when you have people interviewing, you know, people from African private sectors. And, you know, at the end of the interview, you know, they're talking about, you know, the amount of Bentleys that I own, the amount of Rolls Royce, you know, um, amount of Gulfstream, you know, that I have or so. I mean, it's irrelevant, you know, to the conversation. What we should be saying to ourselves is that, look, you know, where do I want to go? Where do I want to take this company? Who are my international competitors, you know? What, who are the people that I want to be competing with on a global basis, you know, rather than talking about, about you know, those kind of issues, you know. It shows right, let, certain let's level. focus on that shrinking yeah. of the public sector. And let's yes. go back to Nigeria and South Africa. Yes. Let's say for a moment that we got the policymakers, decision makers in these two countries to shrink the private sector. I mean, that's far from the reality in South Africa, where we're sitting with two million civil servants or public servants at the moment, um, and their contribution to overall GDP has done nothing but drop since 1994, Kaz, to uh, put the, the blunt reality out there. Is it possible, let's go back and say, let's shrink the public sector? I agree, and, and I agree that, that we should enable the private sector to play. I mean, essentially, competitiveness is going to be driven by the private sector, it be, and it's going to be driven by corporations. We need to enable them to do that. I, I, I think that what we need is a more efficient and facilitating public sector, okay? Whether we need 100 people to do that or whether we need 50 people to do that is a, is a debate we can have, but that's what the public sector should be doing. And it comes down to accountability, And it definitely. comes down to accountability. It comes down to understanding how economics work. But having said that, I also agree that, that if the private sector is going to be the sort of engine that leads economic growth, then I think it does need to do that responsibly. And, and my own view, and certainly I want to promote this in South Africa in my BUSA capacity, is to say that post today, post the elections, let's get five, six private sector leaders together and say these are the critical issues in the country. It's not unemployment, it's education and skills, okay? It's inequality, it's poverty. Now, these are the hard issues. We want to talk about these hard issues, and in talking to our stakeholders, we accept 
that compromises are going to have to be made along the way. Now, government, labor, let's sit down and talk about these issues. And, and I think that the conditions exist for the private sector to take the lead in this. Uh, and, 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 and not because we're good guys or so. Because I think that if we don't begin to challenge the other sectors, we don't begin to, begin to make progress in this. In 20 years' time, we're not doing business. You know, it's not rocket science. If, if, if poverty increases, if inequality increases, and these aren't just the embeds of government. These all go to the heart of sustainable business and a sustainable business environment. So I think, I think the opportunity is there. I think we have, certainly in South Africa, we have a structured, sophisticated uh, business sector. Nigeria has a large business sector. I think the opportunity is there for the private sectors to get together and say, how do we drive this and what, how do we need to conduct ourselves to do this? Again, I'm looking for those short-term wins. You mentioned education. Nigeria, South Africa, forming an education partnership. It's something that we've neglected across the African continent, whilst our peer group, namely China, Brazil, Vietnam, have all invested aggressively in education for the future. It could be our downfall as a competitive emerging market. Shay, unity on education, Nigeria, South Africa. Yeah. Um, sure, you know, we should, we should have unity on education, but I think, you know, what we have to have, and you know, even though, you know, we're talking about, you know, Africa, you know, uh, South Africa and Nigeria, um, I'd like to make this, you know, a much more, a much more African issue, you know, and I understand, you know, um, that ni both Nigeria and South Africa are probably driving the issues, but I think, you know, what we need to do in Africa is to have practical, functional education, okay? Because, you know, if we don't, if we don't have a workforce, you know, that has the skills, you know, that have the skills and bring those skills to, this, to the table, then, then we're going to be in, 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 in real, real trouble. Because, you know, the business of 10 or 5, 10 years from now, we don't even know where they're going to come from. You know, I mean, like, you know, the internet, you know, for instance, you know, is a very recent occurrence, you know, who knows where the next opportunity is going to come from? If you have, you know, a workforce that is not, you know, at the forefront, you know, of, you know, that doesn't have the skill, that is not at the forefront of getting these things done, you know, then, then you're, in, you're, you're in trouble. And, you know, both at primary, secondary, and the tertiary education system in Nigeria and in South Africa should focus on one question. What do we want to achieve? And how do we align those educational systems, you know, to get us what we want to get? Now, the question of, you know, cooperation between, you know, our two countries is something, you know, that can, can be worked out in, in details, you know. But at least, you know, we have to have the broad macro objectives of where we're going in order to make sure... You know, Nigeria that itself yes. is a long way yes. from that ideal when it comes to yes. education. Yes. I recently hosted a presidential task team on education in Nigeria, and, and one of the most widely quoted statements was that those who can't, in Nigeria teach. Those who can't teach. That is the status given to teachers in Nigeria. So there is a long way to go to revamping this very system. No question about that. No, no, no question about that. You know, we, have a, we have a long, long, long way to go. And um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure you know, that we are addressing the, the issue the way we should honestly be addressing the issue. Um, I, I'd like to give you know, practical examples, you know, for instance. You know, if you take a look you know, at, at the, primary, at the you know, primary education, you know, where, you know, where we're starting for, which is really basic, the basic bedrock, um, the, public, the public sector system is completely destroyed. So we have to be saying to ourselves, you know, what are the innovative ways you know, by which we can do this? You know? And again, you know, I'm getting back to the issue of you know, private public sector working together. One of the things, you know, for instance, you know, that we do in KPMG is that we adopt the school. You, know, you have to go out. You have to go to these public sector schools you know, and give hope to the people. You have to give hope to pupils and say to, your, to, to them, you know, look, you know, I'm a role model. You know, I've achieved this you know, because, of, you know, because, of, because of education. You know, and I want to come over and give you hope. You know, adopt them. You know, go there about you know, once or twice in a month you know, to basically you know, teach. You know, but also, like I said, importantly, represent a role model. That's just at the primary, you know, primary level. You know. We can talk about issues you know, that you need to do 
both in the secondary and the you know, tertiary you know, sector. But you know, it's, it's horribly complex, you know, but there's no question about the fact that you know, we can address these issues if we want to. Professor Ntuli Ngube, the Chief Economist at the African Development Bank, thank you very much for joining us. Sir, I read a report that you penned just before the World Economic Forum, and that was on reducing the poverty equation across the African continent and, and dealing with the triple problem of unemployment, inequality, and poverty. You've stated in conclusion on that report that you need to, one, reduce the income gap between the top 10% and the lowest 40% of income earners across the African continent, and you also need to increase income per capita across the board. And that is to effectively reduce poverty by 2030. Is it viable? Is it going to happen? Can we force the agenda? It's viable. We have to be determined to do it. It's certainly right that what, what we've seen in the last 15 years, or even longer than that, is an Africa that is growing, but inequality that is rising. And, and, and that's, that's an issue. And, and we know that when there's inequality uh, you know, increasing in any economy, that will, in fact, eventually slow down growth as well. <laughs> so so we, we, need, we need to de deal with that. And, uh, so so, so, to, so to, to keep growth going, it's important to engage in serious structural transformation. That, that's the only way, which will ensure diversification of, you know, of, of the productive base, manufacturing bases, away from natural resources, or just enhancing that uh, and making sure that we can create those jobs, and then that, that will eventually raise people's incomes and then take, take us down to a, a credible path to poverty reduction. At the moment, the most optimistic scenario with the current rate of growth per capita incomes, we're looking at poor poverty dropping from the current 43 or so percent to about 26 percent in terms of head count. But if we do the things that I'm suggesting, then we can um, take it down to about 15 percent at the best. Uh, unless you have Swedish type level of equality, which is nirvana, frankly, in our part of the world, uh, then the best we can do is 15 percent. Yeah. Average poverty rate across the African continent around about forty percent. Oh, it's, it's much higher. Much higher. Than much, that. Higher, oh, much higher than that, and, and it differs from country to country. It's high in Nigeria, high in Congo DRC, uh, and the, sort of the large countries tend to be uh, show higher levels of, of poverty, and, and lower in a place like, like South Africa or, or Rwanda is at a massive reduction in poverty levels. So it varies right across, but the but the average is about forty eight percent. About forty eight percent. Just in terms of the definition of poverty, are we talking about people earning under $2 a day or under $1 a day? What definition are we looking at? Well, we're looking at extreme poverty here, under $1.25 a day. This is extreme poverty that, that we're talking about. Professor Ntulia, I'm just going to take another minute or two with you. We've been talking about integration, about how we can leverage uh, the two big economies on the continent, Nigeria sitting at $510 billion in terms of GDP as per its 2013 rebasement. That's some 60% bigger than South Africa. Kaz Kavadia is saying size doesn't matter in this equation. Let's get Nigeria, South Africa talking. What are your thoughts on the subject? Uh, 15 years ago, South Africa made a huge contribution to the economic reforms in Nigeria by the foray of companies, uh, MTN uh, and so forth, the mobile telephone companies, the banks and so forth. So already the two economies, in my view, are intertwined. Uh, so, so really, uh, and we know that some of the banks, which are originally from South Africa, make more money out of, in terms of margins from Nigeria than they do back home in South Africa. So it's quite clear these two economies have to work together. They're big powerhouses. I think we just need to find a way to create, let me call it a triumvirate, which is South Africa, Nigeria and the Kenya, and hopefully when Egypt comes right, you know, it, it will soon, and then we'll hook in Egypt. I think that would be a fantastic, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, foursome that will really drive and power Africa in our view. We're going to open up to the audience for questions at this point, but I am going to just break protocol for a moment, and I hope that the director can bear with me. I think it's important we've been discussing education. I think it's important that we take a minute uh, to stand and observe a minute of silence for the 208 Nigerian schoolgirls that are currently missing. If I could ask you please to stand. <laughs>
Thank you very much. You can take a seat. Could open to the floor at this stage on any competitive uh, issues that you would like to touch on. Low hanging fruit, we are looking for solutions, particularly at this business broadcast. Any takers? Thank you very much. If I could get a roving mic. Uh, my name is Rob and I'm from Lancaster University, Ghana, and transnational education. Um, we recently opened up our university in Ghana, and uh, one of the main issues which we see is uh, Everything we have to purchase in the local market is imported. Um, so when our governments in South Africa, Nigeria, across Africa, are going to start facilitating and promoting people to start manufacturing locally, um, there's nothing really being done about it. And the more you import, the more your currency is going to be affected by uh, balance of trades. And if you've seen in the last six months, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa have all had issues and major currency fluctuations, which also then affect your FDI. So the solution, shall we weigh in with our economist, Professor? If, if you look at Ghana, what's really been going on is a, a typical classic twin deficit issue. We have got a, a, a budget de deficit of the order of 12%, uh, current account deficit of the order of, of, of 13%, and those two are intertwined. intertwined. Debt levels are approaching more like 60% of GDP. And uh, if you look at import cover, in terms of just reserves, it's due now down to less than one month. And so that's a pretty serious situation. No wonder why the currency you know, uh, collapse in commensurate with those weakening fundamentals. So it's a pure macroeconomic management uh, issue. But, but, but you're right. Ghana is importing tomatoes from next door. You know, people are not growing tomatoes in Ghana. Uh, of course, it's good for, for those countries where they're importing from, but not for Ghana. It's, so, so it's one thing is very clear that they, they need to be considered all effort to, to grow a, a local manufacturing. So what, what, are, what are the constraints? Uh, energy or power is a big constraint to manufacturing. The cost of it, the availability of it, it is constraining productivity by a huge amount, 30, 40%, very easily. So power is an issue. The other is, is finance. I look at, at Ghana now with, you know, the treasury bills, 90-day treasury bill at about, what, 25%. Who, who is borrowing? And if, I, if I'm running a bank, I just buy treasury bills. It's, it's just easier, you know, frankly. So, so, so just the, the access to finance, the things like that. So, so these are things to fix, uh, uh, whether through you know, more competition in the banking sector, obviously, smaller government activity, much more prudent government activity in, in, in that respect, and then dealing with the infrastructure deficit around power. I, I think this is a, a, a way to go. The other thing to watch is, is wages. African wages are not low by global standards. Actually, they are quite high. Africa is a high-cost manufacturing base compared to Southeast Asia. I often wonder whether we'll be able to attract all those you know, jobs, so to say, from Southeast Asia as things get more expensive over there. Wage-wise, can we really compete? And there are questions about our own level of wages in Africa. So these are some of the issues to deal with. Kes? Yeah, look, I, I agree with, with all of that. But also, you know, we keep on talking about the growth of small medium enterprises, for instance, and even in manufacturing, you, with medium enterprises, you can get your manufacturing sector going. But as we talk about that, and, and as we say, those are going to be the engines for job creation and so on, what we continue to do is we continue to put more and more red tape in the way of businesses forming. In other words, regulation killing small businesses, which could killing, help us. Re regulation killing small businesses. Uh, so so I, I think that we do need to, to broaden and deepen our manufacturing sector. But to me, the critical issue is regulation, and the critical issue is for governments to actually begin to understand. And I think there needs to be, there needs to develop a level of trust between government and business, for governments to actually understand that businesses will operate and will invest where there are profits to be made. We talked about responsible business, it's got to be within that context. But governments need to understand that and governments need to facilitate that. I see there was a hot button pushed when you spoke about small businesses regulation. Shay, you want to come in at this no, point? Yeah, I just want you know, to, to make a point. You, know, I mean, you see what Prof, Prof is talking about. You know, if you take a look at Ghana, for instance, you know, what's the issue? The issue is that government spending is out of control in Ghana. You know, that's the problem. You know? And so what did they do? You know, instead, of cutting, you know, instead of cutting back on government expenditure, they instituted capital controls. You know, 
which basically you know, works in the opposite direction. If you take a look at Nigeria, you know, what's the problem? The problem basically is that if you take a look at our budget in 2014, we're spending about 76% on recurrent expenditure. And we only have you know, about 24% left in you know, capital expenditure. And you know that with government, you, know, you take 50% of that has to be taken off you know, because you know, they are an ineffective and inefficient you know, spender of, you know, of money. So in other words, you know, what you have is half of the 24% that you're supposed to be spending that will be effective. You know, see, in a sense, you know, my own solution basically is this. You know, I say, maybe what we should do is this. Uh, especially in Africa, you have to say to yourself, you know, put the money in the hand of the guy who can spend it the best. So I would, you know, as a general policy issue, say cut taxes. You know, because I want the disposable... Cut taxes. Cut taxes, you know, and skewed taxes in, in the direction you know, of indirect taxes rather than direct taxes. I want the money in the hand of the guy who can spend it the most efficiently. You know? And to me, you know, that's me and you, you know? especially in a, in a continent you know, where you bring your own services. You know? and then, so, that, so that's what I'll do. You know, I'll put that disposable income you know, and not trust government you know, to spend me you know, out of poverty. Professor Mube, how does that fall in with your report where you say government has a responsibility to impact that poverty, the, the widespread poverty that we're dealing with in Africa? Um, um, well, I, I think that really the temptation perhaps to push for tax cuts is there, I can see. But for a start, the, the tax collection levels in Africa are already low by global standards. So, so I, I'm not certain that perhaps cutting tax, taxes may, may, may do it. Uh, I, I still believe that if you really want to help small businesses, just make it easier for them to set up businesses, to comply. It shouldn't, just, it shouldn't be difficult. It should take one day to, to register a company electronically, and that's it. If it's more than 24 hours, then it's too long. You know, and, 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 and then after that, provide them with basic services, again, infrastructure issues, power if they need it, and so forth. Simple infrastructure to support what they do. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, necessarily in favor of the argument of formalizing the informal sector. Let them stay informal. There's a reason why they're informal. But make sure that they have access to infrastructure and the services uh, that they, they, they need. So, 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 yeah. so, so, so taxis, uh, you know, let's take taxis in the mining sector, one of my favorite subjects. I'm not in favor of tax breaks for mining sector and so forth. It just doesn't help anyone. Let's go back to the floor at this point, Oruma. Uh, thank you. Uh, you um, got the panelists to talk about energy poverty and education. I have specific questions for each of the panelists, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Bickerstedt. Um, having um, supported the financial sector across Africa and focusing more specifically on how to empower uh, Africans, I want your thoughts on raising the level of financial literacy in Africa, the impact that it would have uh, on creating more financially responsible citizens across uh, Africa. For Mr. Kovadia, I'd like you to comment about also encouraging greater digitalization, more Africans being familiar with just using technology tools. We've seen uh, what's happened uh, with uh, the advent of mobile phones and, and technology generally. But if we had a policy across Africa where everyone was taught how to leverage technology better, uh, what impact uh, it would have. And to Professor Nkumbe, I have a question for you which I often ask, and I've asked even when I was at the African Development Bank, what will it take to get Inga to work so that we can energize all of Africa? Because I think Inga can basically cover Africa and cover uh, many other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shay, let's start with the, the financial sector and raising the sector of financial literacy. Yeah, I, um, you take a look at 2008 in Nigeria you know, and what happened. And, and you know how very important you know, financial literacy is. Um, a lot of people that you think, you know, that you thought at that particular time you know, were financially literate um, turned out to be completely illiterate you know, when it come, came to financial matters. And a whole lot of people lost their fortune you know, because of that. You know. They took a look at the market, you know, said, said to themselves, you know, oh, this is a rising market, a market that will rise you know, forever. You know, there were all kinds of you know, issues you know, with that particular market in Nigeria. 
insider trading, you know, all kinds of issues, you know. I mean, you know, governance, you know, with regard to, to various, you know, to various companies, you know, that people completely ignored. People lost their, you know, people lost their lives. People lost their, you know, people lost their fortune because of that. So I think, you know, the whole issue, you know, of, of teaching, you know, literacy, of teaching, you know, issues of corporate governance, you know, becomes very, very, very important, you know, in, in going forward, you know. And I, what I have to do basically is that I have to, you know, thank your own organization, SEC, you know, because of the kind of things, you know, you're doing, you know, to raise that level of literacy in Nigeria. And especially the work, you know, that you've recently done, for instance, you know, with one of the major banks in Africa, which is Echo Bank International. You know, thank you very much. You know, but it, it's an important topic, you know, that we have to discuss and talk about. Kaz, utilizing technology, mobile banking, we've seen how that's revolutionized the African continent. That policy that Arunma points to that could be standardized across Africa, encouraging the utilization of technology. No, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, by 2040, we have 1.1 billion working age population looking for work on the continent. Those people need to be trained and skilled for the new type of global economy. And the new type of global economy is technology, it's digitalization, it's, it's, it's IT. And, and, and one, we need the appropriate policy infrastructure, and uh, sorry, the appropriate policy. So again, take South Africa. I mean, broadband is expensive. Uh, we don't have enough broadband, okay? Uh, and yet we're supposed to be, one of our competitive niches is supposed to be IT communication and so on. We're doing something wrong. Uh, we need to, if there's one area we can cooperate across Africa, it's on IT and, and, and putting in the necessary infrastructure to ensure that, that people get digitalized. So, so I think it one is the policy, and secondly, in the way we train young people, in the way we train and skill our workforce, has got to be towards becoming tech, tech, technology savvy, Otherwise, we're not going to have the sort of workforce to compete with some of our competitors. And then Arunma refers to Inga Dam, and it's a pet hobby horse of mine. Many stats during the rounds, Professor Ngube, on Inga Dam and the hydro power plant, what that could potentially do, as pointed out. In most say that we could power half of Africa comfortably. Now, wouldn't that be a simply fantastic example of regional cooperation if we could get Inga Dam started, notwithstanding it's been three decades in the making, longer. Your thoughts? Where can we go from here? The, the, the trick is to see Inga Dam, Inga project, as a regional project and not as a national project. Because as a national project, then we have issues. Governance you start, issues. Exactly. Then you start looking at the rating of the country, Congo DRC, risk rating, that is. Uh, you look at who is off-taking and so forth. So you begin to ask some, some hard questions. So you see it as a regional project. That is the way to go. Uh, and this has already happened. If you look at what, what has driven the latest you know, uh, surge in you know, the move forward, progress on this project, is the MOU between Congo DRC and South Africa, which is now going to open the way for ESCOM to be an off-taker uh, when the uh, electricity when it's produced. And that is the trick. A, a political will within a region, seeing this regional project and having off-takers right across the region from day one. And that will then lower the risk uh, uh, on, uh, in terms of risk perception on, on the project away from the country or location risk, but to the more often the off-take risk. Uh, uh, that's what we should focus on. As the FDB, we have funded the feasibility study, a huge document, very, very exciting indeed. And, and I think you will see progress from, from now on. What is going to be trick different to this be time around, though? What is going to be different? Why is it now going to kick start? When it, it, was, it was really the off-tech issues. Who is going to be buying this electricity? What agreements are in place? Now with ESCOM or South Africa on board, that makes a huge difference. As I said, that it shifts the risk away from the location risk of the project to the risk of the off-taker within the entire region, which is a much lower risk level. And that will allow uh, uh, you know, investors to put in their money. Certainly, as a bank, we will. We already have in terms of feasibility study. And it's going to be done in, in phases, which are, uh, allow investors to you know, assess things as they go along. Gentlemen, we've been chatting for, for around about 45 minutes now. And, and I want to bring the panel to a close. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask each of you to, to make a short closing statement. And I want to go back to the topic at hand. And that is driving competitiveness through cooperation, integration, 
economic growth, leveraging the two big economies on the continent, namely South Africa and Nigeria, to drive that agenda. Professor Ngube, I'm going to start with you in terms of low-hanging fruit. I think as we move from this room into the main World Economic Forum on Africa venue, we can take this upon ourselves to drive the agenda in the talk shops that we attend and in the many business meetings that you will be uh, executing over the next couple of days. So let's look at this as low-hanging fruit. What can we do to change the status quo while we are here at the 24th World Economic Forum on Africa? Professor Ngube. The three important pillars for regional integration are movement of people and talent, movement of, of, of capital, and then movement of goods and services. For me, there's some low-hanging fruit in terms of movement of people and talent. We haven't fully exploited that. Get rid of the visas, frankly. And then on, on, on capital, in terms of intra-Africa investment, there's a lot going on. There's a lot more that could take place. Let's go for it. When it comes to, to in terms of imports and exports, that's, that, that's high-hanging fruit. Kaskavaria. Yeah, let me just quote something. The Pan-African Competitive this forum is having its sixth annual conference later this year. And the theme, enhancing Africa's socioeconomic development through cluster competitiveness as a catalyst for transformation, innovation, entrepreneurship, accelerated regional integration, and intra-African trade. Uh, I think that captures what we're talking about. And to me, some of the low-hanging fruit, travel issues, borders, IT, I think there's tremendous scope to to, to cooperate, skills and capacity to want to build and then to keep the skills and capacity within Africa rather than going away, uh, uh, and then intra-African trade. I think there's a lot to do. Sure. I think, you know, three things for me. You know, obviously, we've got to deal with the issue of infrastructure, okay? That's one. The second, you know, the second one you know, that we've got to deal with basically is, you know, is adding value in Africa. Rather than being an exporter of just resources, you know, we've got to make sure that we have the value in Africa and that the value you know, resides in Africa. You know, and the third thing, you know, um, basically, is that um, when, we talk for, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, about, uh, about compliance, for instance, um, which you know, Professor you know, Kube was talking about, you know, one of the underlying things, one of the things that's extremely important, that's most important, is, is, is government itself, you know, how does government you know, spend money? Because you know, I'm going to be compliant if I feel that government is spending my money responsibly. If government is not spending my money responsibly, I don't want to be compliant. And that's the reason why I said, you know, give me my money so that I can spend it responsibly. So what I'm saying basically is that we need a government that spends the money that we give to them you know, through tax you know, responsibly. Otherwise, don't expect me to be responsible. So, so, so better governance, infrastructure, and beneficiation. Absolutely. Can I get you to give me a third vote on the visa issue? Because I think that is a low-hanging fruit. I personally take this on as a challenge. Can you join us in this forum if we can just start with that first basic step? Let's try and get the policymakers and the decision makers to drop visa requirements on the African continent at this forum. Yep. Shay, do I have your go ahead? You have my go ahead, you know. And when I get to South Africa, I also want to see very friendly people. After the visa issue has been dropped, <laughs> I also want to see very, very, very friendly people, you know, at the immigration desk, you know, that <laughs> welcomes me as a brother and says to me, you know, you are my brother, instead of, you know, somebody from Nigeria, you know, that is exporting something that's prohibited. We have a third voice on dropping visa requirements. We've covered a lot of detail on Great. driving competition across the African continent. We've talked about power pools in terms of alleviating energy poverty, which is restricting the continent. Intra-Africa trade sitting at 12%. Let's look to the free movement of people, of goods and services, and let's get that 1.1 billion strong population on the African continent working for us, in Africa, for Africa. Let's look at the financial sector. Improving financial literacy is a key issue. Encouraging the utilization of technology, IT, is crucial to the betterment of the, the broader, broader African population. And then Inga Dam, as a, a regional power play and going back into the energy poverty of the continent, perhaps that's one thing we can spearhead. We can get 
everybody across the African continent to work together to put forward poss possibly one of the biggest shows of regional integration and have the opportunity to power half of the African continent. On that point, I leave you. Thank you so much for joining us for this business broadcast, Brand SA and KPMG coming to you from Abuja in Nigeria, where the 24th World Economic Forum on Africa is currently in session. <laughs>